All right. And I have about five more minutes. So I want to make sure I have enough time. Um, so we're going to go into effect size and power. Um, that might take us a little bit past the point. Give me a thumbs up if you guys are okay if I go a little bit like five, 10 minutes over. Okay. We were talking about COVID early on. So that's why I can do this stuff. All right. So now that we know alpha meaning first type one errors, right? Um, and beta type two errors, we can talk about a little bit about like these parts of the test. So one is effect size. So this is where I kind of like relative error versus um, um, relative difference and stuff like this. Um, these are really useful, especially for meta-analyses. So basically where you're comparing multiple studies. And again, here's an equation. Don't worry about the equation. <laughs> like you're not gonna ever have to use that really. Um, but there's actually one, this is just one example of how you can measure um, uh, effect size between different groups. So in this pink and this blue, basically have two different groups. Um, you can think of this, um, I'll go gender typical for the US. Um, pink being girls, blue being gr men or something like that. Um, and basically saying this like value on the side right here is saying, okay, what these are, it's, um, I don't know, I'm just gonna make something up. Um, let's say weights or something like that. So like how heavy you are or something. And so obviously some people, you know, there'll be a, a mean, an average, maybe it's normally distributed. Some people are a little bit lighter. Some people are a little bit heavier on the other side, right? And the same thing with like on um, this uh, blue side right here. Some are a bit lighter, some are a bit, um, heavier, but there's kind of a difference between the two. Um, with certain, you know, let's say certain species or something like that, maybe the difference is very, very small, but there is a difference. These both can be statistically significant from each other, right? Like saying, oh, there's a statistically significance between the weights between like female and male and like um, for like this species. And then let's say for this species, like, oh, there is a difference, but it's relatively small, okay? And so it's nice to know what these differences are. And so I'm kind of going through a little bit. Yeah, we're going to ignore this part. Um, Cohen's D statistics. So Cohen's D, um, I think this is where the curriculum, give me a thumbs up if you guys have come across Cohen's D already in the curriculum. All right, I see a couple thumbs up. So Cohen's D basically is one way to measure this statistic. One thing to note about this um, is that this right here um, should, doesn't have any units. It's just basically a, a number. And so the idea here, basically, you consider the standard deviation of saying, how much does this spread? Okay, how many um, points do you have, or how many data points do you have? And then comparing those two means. So this um, sigma squared pool, it's kind of like the pooled variance. And this right here, basically saying, okay, well, if you have a large number of people and a large variance, Okay, that number will go up and so like you have a larger variance, right? If you have a smaller variance and or, and or a smaller number of people, you have um, a smaller overall um, sigma squared, very, um, sigma squared uh, pooled. And then we basically take the difference between those two means and say, okay, but how much of a difference is it from the standard deviation? So that's Cohen's D statistic. There are other ways to measure, um, what's it called, um, effect size. Cohen's D just happens to be a really common one. Um, and the one that we talk about in the curriculum. So overall, the rule of thumb, because there are no units, right? Small effect is like 0 0.2, medium effect 0 0.5, large effect 0 0.8. These are obviously very like fuzzy exactly what these are. Um, you can always pull out the exact difference between the means, right? And that's what you probably have here. But this gives you a rule of thumb being like, okay, like we can talk about the means, but the means might be different. Um, even though they're the same mean difference, they might actually have more crossover, okay, like we saw right here and right here, okay? So just to kind of quickly show you guys what this looks like. Um, I won't go through the code exactly, right? But basically, uh, we're just gonna create these graphs. Why aren't you doing it? There we go. Okay, we have these little functions and pop this guy and then say, okay. So now I can say pop my PDFs for a Cohen's of 0 0.2. You can kind of see it, the difference right here. It's very, very close together, right? versus a Cohen's D of equals to one, they're much further apart. And then Cohen's D of like 4.0, for example, is huge difference. Like to the point where like, if you saw this, like, I don't even know why you're doing a hypothesis test. Like this is like clearly like, okay, you're pretty different on here. Um, if you, for example, see a huge difference, you're like, what am I even testing for? There's like almost no chance for me getting this part. But um, these are kind of important where you have a statistical test, you can pull out Cohen's D and say, what is this actual effect size? And that can help give you an idea of like, should I actually report this? Is it a real effect that really matters or is it relatively small or, you know, even though it's statistically significant. Okay. Does that make sense to people? Any questions at all when you would use 
Cohen's D or um, this stuff. In general, um, I wrote a whole bunch of code here. You wouldn't write all this code. This is just for me to write an example. Um, literally to write like the Cohen's D basically. Um, I don't even, oh, this is, I didn't even write in here because basically you would, you can pull it out directly from SciPy, which you can look up. Okay. Cool. All right, so now, which I feel weird leaving it at the very end, is power, um, our probability, yeah, our statistical power. So um, give me a thumbs up if you guys heard statistical power already in the curriculum. Anyone? Not so much? Okay, so only a few people. Okay, that's okay. Um, of those people who came, um, gave a thumb up, stuff like, like, stuff like that, who understands statistical power? Or thumbs down if you'd like, I don't know, or sideways, like, eh, kind of. Yeah, that's usually the response I get. It's like, eh, I don't know. <laughs> like, I don't really know about the statistical power thing. So statistical power basically is a way for us to um, figure out our type two errors. So statistical power is literally one minus beta, beta just being like the chance of actually getting this um, false negative, right? And so, one thing I like to kind of show a little bit is that, so basically the, the larger the power, the better, the, the fewer um, beta type two errors we have, right? And what's interesting is that it turns out that power, right, statistical power, alpha, right, our type one errors, sample size and effect size are all connected together. And so I actually really like this visualization, which I'll just share to you guys right now since you guys are all here. Don't worry. Sorry, I'm looking for my Zoom trap. There we go. So this guy right here, which I love this little animation that um, they built together, that someone built this, I don't know, Christopher. Oops, didn't mean to do that. Um, you can see a little bit of um, what we're doing. So usually what's gonna happen in here. Uh, so I'll just kind of show you a little bit how it's connected. So let's say we solve for, We'll just keep it on D since it's already on there. So we can say, okay, oh no, we'll solve for power. So like, what does this mean? So let's say our significance level, we say, okay, alpha is our significance level. Uh, I'm gonna do one tail test just cause it's easier for us to see. We have our sample size, N equals 20, and our effect size is basically of these two populations of this. Um, you can imagine this being like the null hypothesis of kind of like what our, um, what's it called? Our uh, population, and this can be like our uh, treatment group, for example. I'm getting at this control and like treatment group. And what this basically is, is it says alpha is when we accidentally um, say it's significant, even though it's not. So if we're in this zone right here, this is our alpha. This is the part that we actually reject in. So there's a percent chance that we actually uh, mess this up, right? What you can see here is that there's also this beta part where it's actually the opposite error, where we fail to reject. Remember if we're over on the left side over here, right, away from this part, we fail to reject this, right, we're more likely to make a type two error where we really should have said they're different because we can see already from these distributions, they are in fact different from each other, right? Um, so if I increase significance value, so if I increase it, or let's say I decrease significance value to like 0 0.1, right, we should see, it's like, okay, that means like we accept, you know, we are, we don't want to make many chances. We want to make sure we're really certain. So we'll see this red part actually go down. So if they watch it carefully, You'll see if I go down here, you'll see that red part go down. Note that our beta then is more increases, right? It's like, well, if we are need to be like really certain for sure that our um, result actually is significance, we might fail to reject uh, the null hypothesis, even though we really should have rejected it. Does that make sense? So if we landed in this area here, we would reject, we would fail to reject, even though they are in fact two different ones. Okay. So that's kind of like how this alpha and power are related, or this beta, which is related to power, okay? Now, if I increase the sample size, if I increase the sample size, um, what do we, ex or I'll do something simpler, effect size. If I increase the effect size, what do we think will happen to beta, well, um, our power level? Type two will go down. Type two will go down, right? If the effect size is really big, there's less likely for us to make those um, mistakes with uh, beta, right? And if we increase this now, you can actually see, there we go, right? And you can actually see if I didn't make it so drastic, you can also see a little bit on um, alpha, right? We can see that basically this part, right, the likelihood of us actually still making those mistakes still stays there because remember, we can still end up in this zone here. But this effect size will show us a little bit, it's like, oh, beta gets smaller and smaller. Basically, less likely for us to accidentally make, um, say it's insignificant or say it's not significant, even though it is. 
Okay, does that make sense? Cool, give me a thumbs up if that's looking good. Yeah, okay, cool. All right, so kind of similar then right here, we have our alpha and beta, right? Our statistical power. If I increase sample size, what would we expect um, power? Would power go up, power go down? Or I should say, let's start off first. If I increase the sample size, what do you expect the shape of these distributions to look like? Taller. Okay, I, I see, I hear Carl say taller. I see Jessica kind of making some motions over here, which I think <laughs> also saying is taller, skinnier, right? So if I increase N, I'll do it really extreme. You can see it gets much smaller. And sure enough, if you think about that, you're like, oh, well, that's kind of like saying effect size, right? If I make it really small, I reset zoom, that's kind of like having a bigger effect size, right? So having more uh, samples increases our power. Basically, it lowers our beta, um, beta powers or stuff like that. So then you can tell me, okay, cool, Victor. Like, it's fun to play with these little things and animations. Why do I need to care about this? How would I use statistical power? And so usually with statistical power, what you have is this is especially useful when you, let's say, for example, your critical value is just right outside that significance, right? And you're like, ooh, I was so close to doing this. And you're tempted, it's like, maybe I just get like one other person just to see, maybe maybe I just need that one last person that'll become less than you know, 0.05 or whatever your critical is, or your significance is. And what's really nice about your power is that you can calculate your power beforehand. So instead of saying, okay, I collect 13 people, right? For my experiment or you know whatever you're doing let's say you're testing out a new website and say okay is there a significant difference and stuff like this this will be kind of a b testing um instead of saying well let me just get one more person make this n equals 14 and see if it's significant and then kind of move on from there you can instead say okay before you ever do this going back you know back to your past self you say okay i want to see significance value i know what effect size either i want to see or that i expect to see okay and then you say but I want to make sure I don't have um, my beta, my statistical power. I want to make sure this is powerful enough. You can calculate ahead of time saying, okay, I want to figure out what is my sa uh, sample size. So it's like, okay, I want a significance value of 0.05. I'm going to say I expect an uh, effect size of like a rel relatively large effect of like 0.68. Okay. And then you say, okay, how many, um, and then I want a power, like a relatively high power. So let's say it's something like um, like 95, like usually 0 0.8 is pretty typical. So right here. And this basically says, okay, there's still some chance we'll make some mistakes, right, with beta. But with this effect size and this significance level, we need uh, at least a sample of 13.37. So like, okay, we need 14 people. And then you would collect that 14 people. And then you would say, okay, like, is this significant? And if you didn't get significance, what you would then use that part is like, well, there seems to be a suggestion that like, like for the p-value is like relatively close to 0.05, but not quite underneath it. You would say, okay, it's relatively close. So the next experiment we have to do, we should recalculate this power size because now we'd have an effect size itself and say, okay, this is what we should look at to make sure we have a significance or like a higher significance or, you know, um, whatever power you have. So the idea is that you have something called a power calculation where you determine this before you actually do the experiment. And this helps you avoid p-hacking, where you just essentially try to add more um, samples into it, which could actually put you in the opposite direction. It's something depending on, I'm not going to give you guys numbers, but like, uh, you'd be surprised how, how easy it is just adding one extra person into your um, statistical test, that it actually increases it by like something like 20% on for a normal distribution, where you actually reject the null hypothesis, even though you shouldn't have. So it's kind of important. Okay. Cool. Um, any questions about how these are all kind of related together? So effect size, significance level, power. Okay. Cool. Um, so just kind of again reemphasizing, uh, why do we care about power? Basically, is that we're just trying to avoid us accidentally changing the test while we're trying to do the test. Because we basically, if we allow ourselves to change the test, like us how we test, you will technically be correct in the sense of like how you're doing the mathematics. However, your method will not be very good and you can't really trust your results. And sometimes you'll be fine. Like it's like, oh, this is like, I made it, I made this like change. I added one extra person in there and it was actually significant. But if you do this enough times, you will eventually make a mistake that you could have avoided. So knowing this ahead of time is the thing that you're avoiding, um, basically doing. So that's what we talk about, like a power calculation and stuff like that. Okay. Sound good? All right. Any questions at all about all the stuff we kind of talked about? 
I know I went through a whole bunch of things. I kind of skipped through a little bit. Um, for the record, I think I showed a little bit here. Um, I go through some a little bit of scenario, basically like how this works and like what this different um, like physical power. Um, th honestly, this is probably more more stuff that you really need to like worry yourself about. Um, I even talk about like how power calculations stuff like this. In general, um, is that basically you want to know ahead of time what your test is and stick to that test versus um, modifying it. Whether it's like oh I'm going to do a one tail versus a two tail. Um, whether you know what's the level I'm willing to accept your significance level, um, and then even making sure you check your power level to basically say, okay, what is, how many samples do I need? That's typically how it's used. Like, oh, what kind of, how many number of samples do I need to see before I can say this is realistic? And note that because of that, that also means you need an effect size. So usually you need to know what effect size you expect from some pre, um, preliminary data, or you need to say what effect size would actually matter. So you can say ahead of time, oh, I want an effect size that makes this huge difference, like makes a huge difference before it's worth us actually pursuing, like as a company. Um, and then you use your power calculation and say, okay, how many people do, should we collect you basically to test this out on? Okay, I say people, but it could be anything. All right, cool. All right, I know kind of not too much coding today, uh, just got a lot of like stuff, um, but that's kind of a physical test too. Um, next time, uh, we'll talk about like students' Welsh, uh, students' t tests versus Welsh's t tests. I will tell you up front right now, since some of you guys already reached this part with Welsh's, always do Welsh's. <laughs> like Welsh's is more conservative, um, and basically, if you can pass Welsh's t tests, like that means you pass um, students' t tests. And basically, the main difference between students' t tests and Welsh's t tests is Welsh's doesn't assume equal variance. In fact, I don't know anyone actually in the industry. I hope no one does this, but like you really shouldn't use a t-test or a z-test. God, don't don't use a z-test, please. Like no one, like um, in professional level, it just doesn't make any sense for a lot of things that you do. I, again, I hear you, you'll probably come across people and they'll argue for it, but like why not just use the more conservative thing, which is the Welsh's t-test. There's other significant um, other tests you can do. Um, we talked about ANOVA. We'll talk about that for next time uh, for multiple comparisons. But note that ANOVA really is just. A, t a bunch of t-tests and that will actually this right into linear regression as well so that'll be kind of our nice little like go between the two um like transition into our linear regression type okay. cool all right everyone well i'll stop it here um yeah i guess i've stopped recording